Hello, everyone. Uh, sorry for the small delay. Um, I'm Igor Stoppa. Uh, I work for Intel. Um, today, I would like to talk with you about uh, um, my experience, uh, advice, uh, survival course of how to build an IoT device. Um, I hope we can have it as an interactive session, so if you have uh, comments, uh, if you disagree violently with me, feel free to just raise your hand and let's discuss about it. So, a couple of uh, mandatory disclaimers. What you're going to hear is uh, my mostly in a sense or opinion. I do not claim to own any trademark or copyright that I will be using. <coughs> So what are we going to talk about? What is an IoT device? Why do you want to build one? And uh, what it's going to do? Where it's going to live? Um, what are the constraints you have to deal with when, when you create an IoT device? Uh, What are the hardware, software options? Um, th the idea is that here you want to create something maybe for yourself, maybe because you want to sell it, doesn't matter. But the idea is that you want to be as fast as possible, as effective as possible in delivering something which makes you or your customer happy. Um, so that's also part of selecting the, the tools and then how to integrate it. And then some final con considerations about uh, what could be done on top of that. So what is an IoT device? It's a semi-autonomous agent uh, producing and or consuming information, mostly by interacting with other IoT agents. Doesn't say much, but that's what it is. You have this thing and uh, it's supposed to go on mostly by itself, unattended, chit-chatting with something else uh, like that, possibly also with something on the cloud. Uh, for those who, like me, start to have some gray hair, this is nothing particularly different from an uh, embedded device. We used to call them SCADA or with other words. Now the buzzword is IoT, so we go by that. Uh, cloud is the other one. Uh, the difference is that what previously used to be a SCADA costing uh, north of thousands of dollars, now you pay a few bucks and if it's in your pocket and the battery probably lasts forever. So you can finally unleash all your dreams of becoming a spy or monitor, whatever you feel like. And actually what I'm not going to talk about it here, but I find even more scarier is that you can correlate it. I mean, that's what we saw in the introduction with uh, all these cloud services. There's a really unprecedented computational power available. So not every IoT device uh, looks the same. Uh, if you look at them uh, with, uh, it's a bit, yes, like a tree. So you have a cloud which is high above and then uh, you have a nodes and leaves, and uh, some devices uh, uh, in the IoT world are kind of smart, some others are less smart, but probably cheaper. Um, on some you can run Linux, on something else uh, you cannot or do not want to run Linux because, uh, for example, it's more convenient or appropriate to run a real-time operating system, because maybe they are microcontrollers. And they also get to operate in very different environment. Um, if you had them uh, on the internet at wild, they are more likely to be exposed to certain types of threats. Uh, depending on what sort of services they are providing, they are more or less subject to certain types of attacks. And uh, depending on what sort of uh, information they deal with, they might be subject to tampering or not. If you are making some set of box which can uh, play movies, it might be that uh, your user is actually 
also the one who feels like tampering with it. But that's not necessarily the case. Um, from my perspective, what is more interesting is the first of the, these three points. Um, you might think that your, uh, uh, wire, that your local LAN at home is safe, but how many of you have uh, some box that you got from your uh, internet provider or some Android player, uh, something like that? I have one and uh, it's already a couple of Android versions behind and in practice is something which I do not fully control because I bought it. I cannot, I do not have any idea, have any idea of what software it's running and it's exposed to the internet. So potentially malicious applications can touch it. So even if you think that you are deploying your IoT device in a friendly environment like your local network at home, that's not necessarily true. What do we want to do and uh, what is going to limit us? No matter what's the type of device that we are trying to build, we want to do it fast. And we also have a limited amount of resources. Think about it as your hobby project, so it might be something that you do in the spare hour you have uh, in the night or the weekend, or it might be if you have a small team of people and you really want to focus on what you think is going to make a difference for your customers. You don't want to waste your time and money doing something which uh, someone else has already done. Um, constraints. Certain types of use cases are not standard. So you might have to deal with, uh, um, for example, ways to uh, make your device uh, interoperable with others. And uh, there are several competing standards. They are trying to unify them, but you might have to make a choice. Which means that, in a sense, you are betting your money on the fact that the one of the standards that you will choose or more will be the winning one if you are in for the long run. So. The type of device we want to build uh, is a high-end leaf compared to the uh, uh, description I gave earlier, which it means that uh, it runs Linux, it has a certain amount of computational power on board, it, it, it can be considered almost like a PC or almost like what in the past we would have uh, thought to be a PC. Uh, from this perspective uh, and from the fact that we do not want to over-optimize, uh, the idea is we want to be able to treat this device uh, in a, as a non uh, uh, in, in, in a, as standard as possible way. Ideally, we would be able to even uh, develop over it to minimize the amount of tools that we have to deal with. Um, my advice in that sense is uh, it's not so important to choose uh, this or that distro as long as it's something that you are familiar with, something which you can command fluently. Uh, Almost every major distro, actually every major distro nowadays is of good quality, much better than uh, what uh, someone might try to achieve by working on it by himself. Uh, then there comes also the question of uh, how long you want your device to be uh, around. As I said, uh, set the box I bought was very cheap, it was running Android, it was version 4 dot something, and now it's not getting any love from its manufacturer. I cannot run Netflix on it anymore, I cannot install certain application anymore, simply because things have moved on. Uh, I'm under the assumption here that you are trying to build a device where it's providing a useful service and you want it to continue to be usable in the future, which means that uh, 
if you rely on some hardware manufacturer to be your software vendor of BSP, for example, you might get stuck with some old kernel. And that's going to be a problem in the long run. So this is the sort of uh, consideration that I would recommend to have uh, when choosing the hardware. Ideally, you would not need to have any special patch to maintain yourself or the store you choose. Either your device would run on a uh, kernel from mainline. Why? Because uh, most likely then uh, it will not be used only by one single distro but by several, which means that uh, the amount of people using this device is much larger and therefore uh, you have a much better chance of having a software base which has been uh, tried and tested and debugged compared to the single ODM vendor. Uh, the last point uh, is uh, how critical is the data you're going to have on your device. If you're doing a media player, you might have some legal obligation with uh, content owners. Uh, in other cases, uh, if you are dealing with uh, people's sensitive data, then you have a different type of uh, uh, obligation that you have to fulfill. Uh, in other cases, it might be security. You, you don't want to give out too easily personal data of your users. So my recommendation is the approach to the security solution you choose should be uh, proportional to the criticality of the data that is going to live on the device. And why am I saying all of this? Because what we want is to minimize the total cost of ownership. So there's a bill of material, of course, but that's just the most obvious part of it. Uh, you're going to spend time learning new tools if you have decided that you have to use uh, something that you don't know. So in that sense, my question is, do you really want to or have to do it? You might have decided that uh, this is a good learning opportunity for you, then so be it, but it must be a, a conscious decision. The development time, how painful will it be for you to go through the iteration of developing new software, deploying it, testing it, and then going back to the uh, development board? Maintenance. Uh, this is life. Things will be trot for sure. So you might have your nice application, and then uh, after a while, you find out that you have to update some of the other components. And over time, slowly or not so slowly, your API, your ABI change, and you have to maintain what you've written. So my personal conclusion is the more the device we are talking about looks like a PC, the more we can apply methodologies which are typical of the PC world and they have been refined over the years and you have a wealth of resources that you can leverage. You are far less on your own because there's a much bigger community than if you choose some custom niche board which might be the sexiest, sexiest of the moment or it might be slightly cheaper but on the other hand uh, the ODM might disappear in uh, one year or two. <coughs> so when does this make sense? When uh, your resources are constrained, in reality, they are always constrained, but in some cases, you might actually have uh, the capability to afford uh, larger spending, larger investment. In other cases, you might not. Uh, typical example is if you're doing something for yourself as a hobby project, it's just you. And do you want to waste your time uh, playing with the distro or do you want to uh, focus on working on the use case that started it all? Um, for this perspective, the idea is to reuse whatever is available, try not to reinvent. Uh, the hardware cost, as I said, uh, typically is not that critical. Nowadays, most of the boards, they are almost uh, 
equivalent cost-wise and performance-wise, at least uh, unless you are doing some really uh, high performance application, there's going to be very little difference between one board and the other. Um, yeah, the, the simplification is uh, the user is not a threat, which might not be true for some cases. As I said, if you are doing a media player or something which is playing some protected content, but if you're going to be the user, then I hope you're not going to hack into your own device. Uh, and, and similarly, when uh, you really want to leverage uh, what many others have done, uh, other case uh, which can happen in certain situation is uh, you don't want to waste your time uh, waiting for uh, packages that are not part of your core application to rebuild. In some cases, you end up having to rebuild a multitude of packages. Um, to make a practical example, I've picked the Minobor Turbo. Uh, this is a, it's one of the other devices that I know best because uh, it's developed by my same organization, uh, OTC, Open Source Technology Group in Inter. Um, it's small, it behaves like a PC because it has a UFI BIOS, uh, it doesn't have a fan, it has low power. Uh, you can out of the box uh, boot, I, I've tried a few distros, I've tried Debian, I've tried the Ubuntu, I've tried that, they all work. Uh, it has a USB 3 port, so it provides speed and expandability. Uh, other alternatives that I have not tried but should work are the Raspberry Pi 2 and 3. Uh, nowadays, uh, I am told that uh, they are supported out of the box by Ubuntu. What I do not know is uh, if Ubuntu is uh, using some uh, out of kernel patches or not. So that part I, I, I haven't checked. But you might try or you might not care. Um, in my case, just uh, to pick one, I've chosen Debian, but really, you could take whatever you are comfortable with, even I don't know, Arc Linux, if you really like. Uh, the idea is really, do not waste time relearning the basics. Use some environment that you are familiar with. Unless you have uh, some gap to fill and uh, what you know is not capable of filling it. Uh, so, just get it installed. In the case of the Mino board, there is no internal storage. So what it has uh, is uh, uh, two USB ports and uh, one SD card, uh, which is located, I think it's located underneath. Ah, oh, no, sorry, it's here. So, the idea is proceed with the installation put a uh, install installer on a USB key, installed on the SD card, and uh, choose the most minimalistic configuration available. After that, basically all you need in most of the cases is just enable SSH services, enable a firewall, make sure that the only service that can access it is uh, SSH, and uh, that's it, that's your starting point. Um, I really want to stress the part about enabling the firewall. If you're not familiar with it, there are uh, um, websites where you can kind of specify what you want and it will generate some rules. It's not perfect, but it's better than nothing. It's a starting point. Even if you want to play with it by yourself, it's already something that should work. Uh, at the end of the presentation, I have collected uh, a set of links. You, you can refer to those. Um, one thing that I like about the Mino board is that since uh, it doesn't have internal storage, but it uses uh, SD card, once you have created the base image, you can just duplicate that, and then you can uh, happily go and hack without 
caring uh, if you are ruining somehow the installation because you can just uh, <coughs> restore a previous image. Um, then, your application. I haven't uh, defined it yet in the example, but uh, the idea is uh, do not necessarily try to use some standardized protocol unless you need to. Uh, you probably have to exchange some data. So whatever comes familiar to you, it can be uh, user data stream, uh, archive, HTTP page, just go with that. Uh, in many cases, uh, when you em embark yourself on this sort of adventure, uh, there are surprises waiting for you, which you have not, well, they are surprised, so they are unexpected. So what is preferable is to get somehow at the end, get your use case somehow running, and then go back and optimize parts where you might have intentionally uh, use some hack because at least uh, this is a more uh, controlled way of uh, refining your uh, your creation, your IoT device. Uh, premature optimization uh, can be cause for delays or even cancellation sometimes of a product, uh, which in other way might mean that you just get bored or frustrated, and that's not what we're gonna do. Um, other easy way out of uh, one of the typical problems with uh, IoT. With IoT, you are typically using some sensor or actuator, and uh, most of them come over some uh, industry standard buses. They can be I squared C, SPI, uh, camera buses, one wire, whatever. Um, they are nice, they are optimized, but my advice is. Uh, go with USB if you can. USB is old, it's not particularly optimized bus, but exactly because it's old, it has been debugged quite thoroughly. Uh, if you have chosen proper hardware, you also have uh, good kernel drivers. And uh, the upside of it is you do not need to develop uh, on the target device because your main PC has a USB port, so you can even develop your application directly on that. Uh, the major drawback of USB is uh, it's gonna make your device to draw higher power, but as long as you are uh, doing some application which is okay to deal with the uh, world so if you're not running on battery, USB is the cheapest and easiest way out of your problem. And most of the sensors are available either as a USB device or as whatever bus they really have. USB is a convenient way to hide the complexity of the sensor behind some more standard uh, bus. Also, at least the board I choose uh, has one USB 3 port, so uh, throughput is not even a problem. In some cases, uh, if you have a uh, uh, USB 2 port, uh, you might have issues with throughput, but with USB 3, no. Um, as a very simple example, I choose to create an IP camera. So in this case, all you need, if you're following my advice to use a USB, is just a webcam. You don't need much more than that. You need a webcam. You already have support for it with, with the for Linux, hopefully. Nowadays, uh, I haven't found a single webcam, even these uh, 50 cents ones that you can find on eBay that wouldn't work with Linux. And then you need GStreamer. So, the last GStreamer tools on the SD card that you had, or rather on the copy of it, uh, I've put a couple of comments that show how to uh, s set up a simple uh, streaming server. And that allows you to stream uh, video from inside the device. Now, of course, you are not connected directly to the device, so what you want to do is to stream this video elsewhere. Uh, again, I'm gonna use a Hammer-like solution, but it's secure proof. 
Uh, just establish uh, in the way you prefer SSH tunnel to the device and forward the port where uh, the streaming is available. And you have already created your uh, streaming IP camera. Uh, this might be suboptimal because uh, I think it generates uh, twice the encoding. So there are ways to do it better. But in this case, I would be more concerned about keeping the device safe, secure. Uh, it's not uncommon to read in the news of some uh, C device uh, which uh, uh, has some security hole so that random people can uh, log into it. I actually think there's even a search engine for these cameras. So my main message is uh, no matter what you do, avoid growing the attack surface. When you are exposing your sensitive data to the network, uh, be overkill in that sense. Do not try to optimize it, rather make sure that uh, you keep low the number of ports you're opening. We already have opened the SSH port, so this solution is basically reusing that. It doesn't require you to open more holes in the firewall. And then I've put uh, reference 11 to the, comment, to the comment that is used to see the stream. Now, this is the part that uh, I said uh, is optional. Um, that's why I call them pain points. You might need them uh, if you're making a C device, uh, something which uh, will be produced in uh, many units, something that you will not be managing yourself. So for example, for a typical PC installation, you are probably happy to just use the software data that comes with your distro. But if you're making a real C device, then that's not enough. You will need some form of software updater. Um, you might want to add additional security features and you might want to add some standardized uh, APIs for interoperability. Uh, coming to the software updater, as I said, the first a simpler option, the one that comes for free, is to use the package manager of your distro. Uh, it's well tested. The problem is that typically they do not provide uh, atomicity to the update. So you might have something that goes wrong and your device is uh, in some intermediate state. Some packages have been updated, some packages have not. If you're managing the device directly, that's probably non-issue. If your user is uh, competent enough to just flash a new SD card and replace it, that's again non-issue. If your user is supposed to be blissfully unaware of this uh, problem that can occur, then uh, you cannot rely on the distro package manager. You need something else. Something else is typically falling in two camps. One is uh, uh, you just ref you have some you have to develop some means to refresh the entire image. Um, I think there was a speech about it yesterday. Uh, it's reliable in the sense that it's a simple operation. You just stream the entire content of the new image, possibly to some small optimization. If you have zeros, you can compress those. Uh, but it's bandwidth intensive in general. The other approach is to use uh, one of the many solutions that are currently being proposed. There's uh, OS3 with Flatpak, uh, Snappy. They are based on containers. Uh, there's a clear Linux approach, which instead uses uh, bundles. Uh, they are far more optimized. Uh, to be frank, they have a smaller use base. So when you use one of those, uh, you are basically deciding to be part of the uh, guinea pigs. That's a fact. So if you feel like guinea pig, go with that. Um, security. There's a lot of stuff that you can do. Uh, I just listed a few of the options that are uh, uh, the more recurring ones. 
And each of them comes with uh, some advantage if you know how to use it. And that's a big if. Uh, I don't claim to be one of those people who know how to use it. Uh, the question is, uh, first of all, do you really need it? Uh, I mean, try to think about what data is going to go on your device, what's the worst scenario that can happen, and then decide if it's worth the effort. O also, you might actually do something bad when you're using one of these solutions. Uh, and that's just about uh, the outcome. The other part that will happen almost for sure is that it will make your life more miserable when you develop on it. Because this security solution, per se, they tend to make it harder to replace stuff on the device. So it means that during your uh, development cycle, you will have to develop means to somehow cope with this additional difficulty. So really, the question is, uh, is it worth? I'm not saying that it's not. It depends on really on what sort of device you are doing. And that's why I was uh, uh, tunneling the uh, video stream through SSH, because in that sense, uh, it's something that is, I think, uh, more likely to be uh, achievable by a random uh, Linux guy than uh, using proficiently one of these uh, security features that I've listed here. And uh, finally, interoperability. We saw a nice demo about uh, Node-RED during the uh, starting keynotes. Uh, there's OCF where Intel, my employer, participates. Soletta also is another flow-based solution. Uh, they're nice. Again, the question is, uh, what do you need them for? Because you will have to create bindings for these. So, do you have a use case where, for example, you want to do something with your phone or with some other uh, uh, IoT device which will interact with it? That might be an answer. It's up to you. Again, I'm not saying that uh, it's good or bad, but it should be a conscious decision. What I can say is that, uh, at least in the uh, IP camera example that I whipped together, you do not necessarily need any of this. For example, you can just set it up as a uh, web page, secure web page, and you can log into it with your browser or your phone, and that's it. So the question is, uh, do you want to do something fancier? Do you want, for example, to run face recognition on the camera? That might require some cloud service, and that might justify creating the bindings for it but you really need to understand the, your use case because there's going to be a cost in creating the bindings and maintaining them. So this is my final message. If there's anything I would like you to take away from this uh, talk is be opportunistic. Don't go for the nicest, cleanest solution. Go for the most effective one, the one that you are more comfortable with something that you feel you will be able to debug. Because there will be a time where the thing falls apart and you don't know why, and you have to debug it. So be nice to your future self. Is there any question? No. OK. Thank you for listening.